Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. A uh, few announcements mainly concerning the activities this evening in terms of the Arizona Wildcats football game. That now has benefited you in a way. Now you can shift your time schedule if you want. Homework number eight is not due this evening, and so you won't have to worry about the D2L mix up in terms of it shutting down or going through maintenance tonight from 10 to midnight. And lab number three, I haven't looked at the sign up sheets. It's probably completely packed for today because it was supposed to be due Sunday. If you need to reschedule, that's fine, I think. Hopefully they'll allow that. I'll talk to the stockroom people if you need to reshuffle your schedule, but that's not going to be due until Wednesday, your write-up for lab number three. And that's the same with the project. If you want additional information, and I've also put together a couple of examples on stepping through the designs for a phase lag and a phase lead controller, those are in unit nine, the examples, the extra Bode plot material is in Unit 8 in terms of notes and videos. Teacher course evaluations, I can't extend those, that deadline. That deadline is not at my control, but that's on Wednesday of next week. And I would like it if you would take the time to complete that. That gives me input as to what to do the same or differently the next time this class is held with me as an instructor. Homeworks 9 and 10. 9 is continuing with the Bode plot material or design and homework number 10 we will talk about that and hopefully after today's class you will have most of the material you need to complete all of your homework assignments. That's the idea. The final exam is a week from next Wednesday, and that's on the 17th. That's a two-hour exam from 8 a.m. to 10, 10 p.m. <laughs> from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Maybe better not have a 14-hour exam. You guys, I'd have to bring in breakfast, lunch, and dinner, have a lot of bathroom breaks. That'd be pretty messy, wouldn't it? So we'll just keep it to two hours on your exam and then you'll be able to make your other Wednesday finals if you have such finals. Today what I want to do is really get into new material, chapter 11, which is full state feedback. You did this in lab number two. Maybe you didn't know what you were, that that's what you were doing or that that's what it was called, but we'll try to work through an example. We'll try to relate that a little bit to what we've been doing so far, but the most recent designs that we've been working through have been based on transfer functions, G of S's. Now we're switching that and we're saying, let's look at a model that's now in the form of state space, a state space model. It could be of the same system. It's just a different way of modeling the same systems. You have a state space model for the mass spring damper system. If you have a differential equation, you can put that, keep that in the time domain and have a state space representation. And then we can design with that. What I would caution you on, it's going to look like, wow, why haven't we been doing state space all along? Because it looks like you can just achieve almost arbitrary placement, well you can, you can achieve arbitrary placement of the closed loop eigenvalues, but you're assuming that you have measurement of every one of your state variables. With the designs that we've been doing so far, we've only measured one signal, the output. In the state space, we're saying, oh, we have position, we have velocity, if we have temperature, if we have pressure, if we have whatever kinds of state variables we might have in our system, we're assuming that we have those measured. 
So that's where we're going today. We're going to talk about full state feedback, but keep in mind that we are assuming now that we have all the state variables at our disposal, and that in an in a realistic setting is probably not true. And there's way there are ways to get around that, but we won't probably get that far. You can build estimators to estimate those state variables that you do not measure. But there's obviously some error between what you're estimating and what the true state variable is. We're, we will look at the ideal case, which is chapter 11, full state feedback, and let's just start by saying what is possible. And again, we have basically changed the playing field since we're talking about games and fields, or we started the class that way with some announcements. If you were coming in a little bit late, the it's pretty busy there, but just read your email. There's been an extension on the homework. So, pardon? Thank you. So maybe that will help, who knows. But now let's get back to chapter 11. And let's now talk about what we are doing relative to state space design. We now have our system description in the time domain. These are now basically a coupled set of differential equations where x dot is a vector of first derivatives. It could be x1 dot, x2 dot, x3 dot. This is now a times x of t plus b u of t, and we will just typically assume that x is Nevada tall, n tall, n could be 10. In the lab, how tall is x? In your lab that you've been playing with all semester, if you modeled that as a state space, in a state space representation, how tall is your state vector, or what are your state ve variables? what would you measure in the lab that would be your state variables? Position and velocity. We just have n, little, no, little n is just two in the lab. We have two state variables, position and velocity, and you can just think of that, x is now x sub one and x sub two. How big is the system matrix A if x is two? It has to be square, doesn't it? It's two by two, and this A matrix is our system matrix, but I'm going to even precede the system matrix by saying this is our open loop system matrix. This is the way the system would respond dynamically if we didn't do anything other than build the system itself, and no feedback, nothing happening other than how the system naturally wants to behave. If I now said, well, how will that system behave? What are its open loop dynamics? Do you remember how we might gain some insight into the open loop dynamics? So we would, we've been dealing with poles, haven't we, so far, G of S. We would say, well, where are your poles? And now I've changed things. Now we've moved into the time domain. Now we have our system represented in the time domain. Now we need to look at the eigenvalues of this A matrix. That now governs the dynamic behavior. So if we wanted, we could say, if we are interested in the dynamic behavior of our system, that would be the eigenvalues of our system matrix. Which I might denote by the Greek letter lambda, lambda of A. Typically we're not happy with the way the system is behaving as built or 
unmodified. In the, system, in the lab, if you go in and kick the mass spring damper, it rings quite a bit. It vibrates quite a bit before it finally settles to its final value. We want to now change that by manipulating the input U. We want to adjust the input into the system and that's now going to allow us to have feedback and our feedback now with this state space representation we are going to assume that we have the ideal situation where we can measure the entire state vector x of t and we're not even going to just settle for that we want to also allow for an external reference input to be applied to the system. Here is our full state feedback vector. And R is consistent with what we've been using in the transfer function based designs. That again is our reference input. That might be this command to go to 2,000 counts. That's our R. And X is our position and velocity that we're feeding back, consistent with how we adjust or how we then weight those position and velocities through this gain matrix K. Let's say that we have one input into our system, U of T, and X is a two by one vector, how big is K, the full state feedback gain matrix? What are the dimensions on this capital K matrix? What do you see as an image? Do you see something that's square? Do you see something that's short and wide? Do you see something that's tall and thin? for K. What could it be? It could be two by two, it could be two by one, it could be one by two. If it was two by two, it would be square, right? If it was two by one, I, that's what I'm saying is tall and thin. And if it's one by two, it's short and wide. What does K need to be if X, X is now tall and thin, isn't it? I'm doing all these hand signals. I guess I'm cheering for the team for tonight, right? There's X. Here is U. And we need the product of X and or K and X to be the same as U when we form that product. Does that give you a clue as to what the shape of K needs to be? That now, I didn't draw this very well, but it needs to be short and wide, doesn't it? It now needs to be a one by two matrix. In order to be compatible with X, it has to have two columns. And to be compatible with U, it has to have one row. Does everybody see that? Now, if we had added to that R, and let's say that we just have one reference input, what's the size, what is the dimension of capital N? Playing with these shapes, I, you know, you grew up playing with blocks. Now we're just playing with blocks. Don't tell your parents that, oh, I went into class today and we played with blocks. I'm paying you that much intuition to play with blocks? Stay home. What's the block size for capital N? has to be one tall, doesn't it? You could say that because you know it has to be compatible with U. So the number of rows for N is one. How many columns does N have? Two. 
n's dimensions depend on what variables? We have three variables there. U, the input, X, the state vector, and R, the reference input. What does N depend on? What is it interrelating? R and U. R, U? U, R. U, R, U, R, how big if you are N? It's relating U and R. U was 1. R was 1, N has to be a 1 by 1. N is not necessarily the same dimensionally as K. Is that clear? But it has to be compatible with the expression that you have built it in. So if our example was X was now N by 1, well it wasn't, it was 2 by 1, wasn't it? Do you want me to do it generically or with a specific number? Generically. So u, let's say u was m by 1. We had m inputs. Now m could be 3 tall. I'm sorry, u could be 3 tall. And let's say that r is p by 1. Can I make this any more interesting? Now what is K? If K were states, how tall would it be? Or how tall does K have to be? By that I'm saying how many rows are in K? With this example, I've now said my input u is m by 1, my reference input r is p by 1, and my state is n by 1. I have to enunciate very well. What are the dimensions on k? Now I'm looking for the exponents on this real matrix r. What are the dimensions of the matrix k? I guess this could be a final exam question if I was feeling like giving out gifts, <clears throat> is it that time of the year? You now might have to actually specify some elements in K, but you first have to figure out how many elements are there. How tall is K as a matrix? Now it has to be compatible with U. U is M tall. K has to be M rows high. How wide does K have to be? Nevada, N. It's always going to be the same as the number of states if K is our state feedback matrix. Now, what's the what are the dimensions for N? has to be compatible with U in the result. That means its result has to end up with M rows, and N has to have the same number of columns as R has coordinates or entries. So this is now M by P, Michigan by Pennsylvania. Is that right? Is that consistent with the earlier example where we said X was 2? So N was then 2, M was 1, and P was 1. You should be okay, right? Now you know your sizes. So that when I start putting all of these together and I just write a K and an N down, they are not necessarily the sh same shapes. They have to be compatible with what they are multiplying and what they need to end up giving you as a result. So now let's combine this feedback U into the system description X dot. Let's now replace the U that I've highlighted in yellow with this expression in blue.
And that's going to then what I'll call close the loop, or now we are going to be closing the loop. We have x dot of t is equal to a x of t plus b, and now we are going to replace u with minus k x of t. That minus is not a subtraction from b, is that clear? This is just a, that's just a negative sign, is that okay? I'm not subtracting anything from b plus in, what did I call this, r of t. This entire expression was just our input u of t. So in this expression, we are simply letting u of t be what we said, full state feedback with a weighted reference input, r of t. But now we can start collecting terms that are being multiplied by the same variables or vectors. So that now we have a times x, we have a minus bk times x, and then we have a bn times r. We can put all of those together and we end up with x of t, or x dot of t, is now a minus bk x of t plus bn r of t. And now I might call this matrix, this is now a system matrix, this is now maybe what I will call f. And that's now our closed loop. system matrix, which says that by introducing feedback, by creating a K matrix, I've now been able to change my system dynamics from A to F. I've now modified my system behavior. We have changed the system dynamics from the dynamics associated with the open loop, which was expressed as A, our matrix A, to a closed loop matrix F, which is now A minus BK. And how would we find the dynamics of our closed loop system? Or what would you do if somebody, if your boss said, What's, what are the dynamics of the closed loop system? Those are the eigenvalues of F now, aren't they? You've now modified your eigenvalues from open loop A eigenvalues to closed loop eigenvalues of F. Let's look at an example. Suppose that we now have x1 dot, x2 dot, and I'm going to forego the argument, but it's of t. These are values of time. And I hope you can see that now all of that time that you spent playing with blocks is actually helping you. You can see how things have to be compatibly dimensioned. Suppose that the system matrix A is 0, 1, 0, minus 1, and the input matrix B is 0, 1. This is our system matrix A, the open loop. Here is our input matrix B. And let's say that our output, Y, if we needed to find an output, let's say that that's now just going to pull off the first co coordinate or the first component of our state vector. 
y is just x sub 1. For those of you that have had some linear algebra or experience with matrices, can you see the open loop eigenvalues of your system matrix A? Do you immediately know where your poles of this open loop system would be? If you found the transfer function of this system, could you determine where the poles are, where your x's are in the s-plane? If I now gave you on the final exam, I said, here is a system where are the poles and zeros and draw the pole zero diagram. You gave me a state space. We've never talked about poles and state space. We have. We'll find the transfer function for this. We know how to do that, right? But the poles of the system are the same as the eigenvalues of your system matrix. And if we know some linear algebra, we know that if we have a diagonal matrix, our eigenvalues are right on the diagonal. If we have a triangular, whether it's upper triangular or lower triangular, the eigenvalues are still on the diagonal. This matrix is actually upper triangular, meaning we have nothing below the diagonal. We have junk above it, but now everything, all of our eigenvalues are on the diagonal. We have eigenvalues, open loop, of, let's say, lambda sub 1 is 0, and lambda sub 2 is minus 1. If you kicked this system with a constant, what would happen? If you applied u of t and you just hit it with a constant, what would happen? I'm hearing quite a few possibilities, aren't I? Or maybe my hearing's not very good, so who knows what I'm hearing. But we have a pole at zero and a pole at minus one. How are we with respect to stability? We're right on the border, aren't we? We're right on the imaginary axis because we're right at the origin. So really, we're not stable. We might, some people might call that marginally stable, but now if I hit that with a constant, I'm actually going to get a, an output that's just going to be a function of t. It's going to grow unbounded. If I put in a step, 1 over s, to something that was 1 over s, yeah, as my system, I now have a 1 over s squared, and you know how to inverse Laplace transform that. That's going to give you a t. So you'll have an unbounded output response for a bounded input. Okay? And if you've done that in the lab, maybe it's making sense now. Okay? Now, what's this look like? So this one, you wouldn't want to hit it with a, a constant. If you had initial conditions, what would happen? If somebody said, what's your initial condition response? What's x sub 1 of t going to do? Or what's x sub 2 of t going to do? Now their initial condition responses are going to be governed by the modes which are governed by the eigenvalue at 0 and the eigenvalue at minus 1. One of your modes is going to decay. The other one's just going to stay with however you set it, wherever you set it. It's not going to decay, and if you kicked it with a constant input, it's going to go unbounded as a function of t. Let's now look at, just to make this connection clear, let's look at the open loop system in the frequency domain, just this maybe is a review for the final. Do you remember what G of S is in terms of these state space variables A, B, and C? Now you'll tell your mom and dad, oh, we learned our ABCs. We played with blocks and we learned our ABCs. 
How do we combine this ABC into G of S? This is now going to be our transfer function matrix, and this is C, SI minus A inverse B. And that should be on your formula sheet if it's not upstairs, right, for the final. Which means that if we wanted to find this, our C matrix was 1, 0. Our A matrix had a 1 in the 1, 2 entry. a 0 in the 2, 1 entry, and a minus 1 in the 2, 2 entry. So if we have SI minus A, that's the matrix. We want to invert that and then post multiply it by the matrix B. I knew I was probably forgetting something. I kind of wanted to show this, but I didn't hook everything up. But you can invert that matrix symbolically on your calculator if you have one of the calculators. You can plug in S in this way and say invert that, and it will invert it. You can now pre and post multiply it by the appropriate matrices, and you will end up with G of S. What's the dimension of G of S? G of S is our open loop transfer function. What are the dimensions of G of S? It's one by one. It's a scalar transfer function. It has one output, one input. So we should end up with just one transfer function. Here is our C. And now if I wanted to invert this matrix, I picked it nice so I can find some of these pretty easily. The determinant is the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. So I now have S times S plus 1 minus 0 times minus 1. I didn't even need to include that, but I did. And now for a 2 by 2 matrix, we simply interchange the diagonals and change the sign of the off diagonal. That's the result of performing finding the cofactor matrix and transposing it, but for a 2 by 2, it just quickly boils down to knowing interchange my diagonals and change the sign of my off diagonals and divide by the determinant, and there's my matrix inverse. And that makes it pretty easy to do for a symbolic matrix that's 2 by 2. Now I simply need to pre-multiply and post-multiply. If I post multiplied by 0, 1, that's going to do what? If I now did this in stages, I have 1, 0, and I have 1 over s times s plus 1. That's just a scalar floating around, and I can slide it either anywhere I want. But now let me multiply that 2 by 2 matrix by that 2 by 1 matrix. That 0, 1 is just saying pull off the last column, the second column in the 2 by 2 matrix, and I have 1, S. And now I have 1, 0 times 1, S. That's just 1 over S, S plus 1. And there's my transfer function, G of S. Where are my poles? They better be the same place that our eigenvalues were. We have a pole at 0, and we have a pole at minus 1. Questions on that? In the curly brace, that's just a scalar. That can slide left or right of those matrices. That was just 1 over the determinant. And now we have this row vector times a column vector, that's going to give us a one-by-one one result. Questions on that? That was really a review for the final, maybe, finding G of S. What we want to do is we want to figure out what is possible to do when we go from an open loop system A to a closed loop system F. What can we do with K? 
how much influence can K have? And now I'm simply going to tell you a result that we will use and in later classes you might derive this or you can look at the book and see if they've derived it. But we are going to check the controllability of this system. And by that, controllability for what we are dealing with is can we actually, if the system is controllable, then we will be able to move the eigenvalues, the closed loop eigenvalues, anywhere we want with that K matrix. That's what we are wanting to determine by checking controllability. We are answering the question, what can be done using full state feedback. Like I said, in this class, you're just going to figure out how to build up this controllability matrix and do the check. The controllability matrix is the input matrix B. It's then the system matrix A times the input matrix B. It's the system matrix squared times the input matrix B, and I hope you see the pattern. I had A to the 0 times B, A to the 1 times B, A to the 2 times B. I just keep going until Nevada minus 1 powers of A, and then I hit that with B. That's this controllability matrix. For our example that we are working on, If we built up this controllability matrix, we now have a B. How big was A? Two by two. So what was little n? Nevada? Two. What's two minus one? One. So we really just have to go that far to produce our controllability matrix for a two by two or a state vector that's too tall, TWO tall. For our variables that we introduced, B was zero, one, and now A times that, A was this, A times B, B simply pulls off the last column or the second column in A, so the product of A and B is going to give me that second column of A, one minus one. That's now my controllability matrix. Have you heard of a concept called rank? The rank of a matrix. That's what I'm referring to with this row. Really, I'm interested in, for our class, we will typically be just dealing with one input. So our B matrix is always one column. That means that our controllability matrix is always going to be squared. And we can check the rank by just looking at the determinant of that square matrix. But in general, we are looking to see are the columns of that controllability matrix linearly independent? Or are the rows linearly independent? We have the same number of linearly independent rows and columns in a matrix. Here we can, I hope you can see that 0, 1 is in a completely different direction than 1 minus 1, so they are not aligned, they are linearly independent, the columns of C. This should say that our matrix, or our system is completely controllable. The rank of that controllability matrix how many linearly independent rows or linearly independent columns it has is two. So this says that our system is controllable. And in, in, in this class, you will just be asked, is your system controllable? You'll then have to figure out what little n is, build up the controllability matrix, and find the determinant of that matrix. And if that determinant is non-zero, 
what is the determinant of C here? Zero times minus one, minus one times one, that's minus one, that's not equal to zero, and that's what we want. We want it, it can be negative, it just needs to be non-zero. Being non-zero says that it's full rank, and we have a controllable system. So that's our check. We know that we can place our eigen, our closed loop eigenvalues wherever we want now. Obviously, if we, obviously, if we put them way out in the left half plane, our k values will be huge, and we probably don't want to do that. But now let's use full state feedback. Now that we know we can put those poles wherever we want, we could put them at minus two plus and minus j two. They don't have to be real. So we can place them anywhere we want with real coefficients in the K matrix. And the K matrix is one by two, so we have two parameters, a K sub one and a K sub two. Let's use full state feedback. To try to place, and we know we can do this, so we're not, we're doing more than trying, but to try to place the closed loop poles or the closed loop eigenvalues of f equal a minus bk and I'm picking two real negative poles or eigenvalues just for illustration but as I said we could have poles at minus two plus and minus j2 or minus three plus and minus J3, or minus three plus and minus J1. We can put them wherever we want. If we have desired poles at minus five and minus 10, we can now create or construct a desired characteristic polynomial. I'll call that delta sub D of S. That's our delta desired. And now I want to create a polynomial that has roots at minus 5 and minus 10. That's all I'm doing. I'm creating a polynomial. How big is that polynomial going to be? Or if I look at the highest power on S, what's that highest power going to be? It, I just have two roots, and now I want one factor to vanish when s is equal to 5. That's going to happen if I just have an s plus 5. And I want another factor that will vanish when s is equal to minus 10, meaning this polynomial will give me roots at minus 5 and minus 10. If I multiply this out, That's my desired characteristic polynomial of my closed loop system. I want to pick my k values to give me a characteristic polynomial that looks like that. Let's now find our characteristic polynomial in terms of the unknown k's. We have f, which is a minus bk. In our example, a was 0, 1, 0 minus 1, B was 0, 1, and now what is K dimensionally? What did you tell me K was before? Two by one or one by two? It's long, isn't it? It's long and wide, so it's one by two, and we need to have K1, K2, because now we need BK to be compatible with A. When we multiply B and K, we better get a two by two matrix. So that now F 
if I do this in multiple steps, there's still my A, and now I'm subtracting. And if I multiply 0 times K1, K2, I'm simply going to get 0 in both places. And now the second row is just going to be a copy of K1, K2, because that's getting scaled by 1. That's the BK product. I can now do that subtraction symbolically. I get a 0 in the 1, 1 entry. In the 2, 1 entry, I get a minus K1. I have a 1 in the 1, 2 entry, and I have a minus 1, minus K sub 2 in the 2, 2 entry. Is everybody okay with that F? That's just symbolic manipulation of A minus BK. And you have to make sure your K is the right matrix dimensionally. It has to be compatible so that BK gives you the same dimension as A. Let's now find the characteristic polynomial of that matrix that's now in symbols K1 and K2. Let's now find the characteristic polynomial of F. And we can do that by looking at the determinant of SI minus F. And I'm going to do that by my determinant symbol is going to be a vertical line. I have SI. I is an identity matrix that's compatible with F minus my F matrix, which is 0, 1, minus K1, minus 1, minus K sub 2. And now I simply have another parameter in there, S. That's going to be on the diagonal. And I have an S in the 1, 1 entry. I have a minus 1 in the 1, 2 entry. I have a K1 in the 1, 2 entry. And I have an S plus 1 plus K sub 2 in the 2, 2 entry. Meaning the de determinant of SI minus F is now the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. I now have S times S plus 1 plus K sub 2 minus a minus 1 times K sub 1. Or I have an S squared plus a 1 plus K sub 2S plus a K sub 1. And now that's exactly what I want. I want to pick K1 and K2 to give me what I desired, which was delta sub D of S, and that was S squared plus 15S plus 50. This is not that hard, is it? This is what I want. Do you see now what I can pick for K1 and K2? I just select those to give me 15 in my linear term and 50 in my constant term. You could have K1 and K2 in both locations, and you might have two equations and two unknowns. Here they're decoupled. We have K1 with the constant term and K2 with the linear term. But in general, what you would want to do is say, let's equate the coefficients. of like powers of S in those two different polynomials. If we equate the coefficients with the S1, we have 1 plus K sub 2. That's supposed to equal 15. So now we know K sub 2 is 14. And if we look at the constant coefficients, we have K1 is equal to 50. And now we know what our full state feedback is. Now we know u of t is minus k x of t plus n r of t. We haven't yet found n. We'll maybe do that Monday. But you can now say that I now have k1 is 50, k sub 2 is 14, and this is x1 of t, x2 of t plus n r of t. So if you were feeding this into the system, you would take 
the first state component, which let's say is position, just for illustration purpose, scale it by 50, negate it, and add it into the input. You would take 14 times the velocity and add that in with a negative sign, and then you would adjust the reference input, R of T, by this scalar N. N was a one by one matrix. And that will now do what? That will give us closed loop poles at minus five and minus 10. And now if I hit this with a step, what's gonna happen? It's gonna decay with modes of minus five and minus 10, which is better than the open loop. We'll pick up close to that on Monday, I think. 